Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Don Stouter and um, this is the first in a series of videos in my Helping Humans Heal series. And today we're going to talk about grief and bereavement. <clears throat> I call this particular presentation a pragmatic or practical approach because I think in some ways we sort of overteach and overanalyze grief and a lot of us tend to forget that grief is a perfectly normal human reaction to a variety of losses. And so that's what I really want to get across today. So let's go ahead and zoom into my computer screen and we'll start our presentation there. Okay, so here we are inside my computer and uh, we're going to have a webinar together called Grief and Bereavement, A Practical Approach. And I really uh, I want to emphasize practical because I think that people tend to overcomplicate grief and we overcomplicate a, a grief instruction and grief training. And uh, I just want us to remember and recognize that grief is a normal human experience. And so with that in mind, let's, uh, uh, let's go forward. Um, a real quick definition of what grief is. It's merely a strong emotion that people experience when they lose someone or something that was close to them. It can occur from different types of loss. For example, a loved one, or a friendship, or a breakup, or, or moving, or even a pet dying. In fact, that's pretty common. Some common feelings are, are sadness, anger, anxiety, shock, and loneliness. Some uh, uh, people also experience a lot of blame or guilt, depending on the situation. And of course, lots of different sort of mind and body symptoms can happen to people uh, uh, during this difficult time, like confusion, or forgetfulness, or trouble concentrating, or fatigue, or body aches, headaches. That's why it's so important to take care of your physical health while you're trying to cope with grief. Um, uh, we talk about stages, and I'm going to talk about these uh, a little more in a little while, but they can include denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. There's really no time limit on grieving. Everybody goes through the process in their own way. I like to think of it as how waves are when you're walking on the beach, right? Your feet are in the water and you're walking along the beach and a wave comes along and it gets your feet wet and then the wave goes back out again and your feet are out of the water. That's a lot like how grief works. It comes over you in waves and then it goes away and then it comes again and then it goes away. And as you're grieving, it's really important to find healthy ways to cope. Now, a more scientific definition of grief is a reaction to any form of loss that encompasses a range of feelings from deep sadness to anger, and the process of adapting to a significant loss can vary dramatically from one person to another. The thing about grief is that it's inevitable. It is an inescapable, an inescapable part of all of our lives. We're all going to lose someone we love at some point in our life. Some of us will lose people at many points in our lives, and those losses often hit us harder than we expect. For me, it's important to uh, embrace this reality that grief is inevitable, that loss is inevitable. Uh, for me, that gives me a little bit of strength in dealing with it. It helps me normalize it. It helps me recognize that a loss is a perfectly normal part of, of our lives. And so we think of it as a natural phenomenon uh, that's common to all of us. As we go through life, we're going to experience a lot of, of, of losses for which we will grieve. It's really not possible to go through life uh, uh, without suffering those losses. And, and so it has to be remembered as, and I would argue taught as, a common human experience. It's common but often unrecognized part of our life cycle. And the thing about this is that we often try to keep kids from this or sensitive people from this reality. We try to protect them not only from death but also from the little losses that happen throughout our lives. And when we overprotect people, or kids like that, then it simply doesn't prepare them for the natural occurrence of losses in our lives. Now, grief counseling, which is something that we offer here at Reliance Hospice and that I've been doing for a while in a lot of different settings, grief counseling is intended to help clients grieve in a healthy manner 
to understand and cope with the emotions they experience, and to ultimately find a way to move on. Now, I would argue that most people will do these things without the help of a grief counselor. But often a grief counselor is good to have around to guide you in the process and uh, uh, to answer your questions and probably most importantly to normalize the experience for you. Now I want to stop right here, right now, and say that all of you who are listening to this and me have had painful losses in our lives. And the conversation that we're having today through this webinar is going to bring up some of those losses. It's going to make you remember some of those losses, sometimes acutely. And I just want to point out that those are normal reactions. Now, a lot of people would say, normal? What's normal? Especially after a significant loss. And a, a friend of mine puts this very well. He says, normal after you've lost someone is really just a setting on a washing machine. Normal is whatever we say it is. Normal is whatever we experience it as. The other thing about talking about grief is so much of the research that leads to the, uh, a lot of the theories that we're going to talk about today really come out of a white colonial American culture. And so it's super important that when we're dealing with folks of a variety of cultures that we ask them how we can best be of help during this time of grief. Uh, some cultures are very verbal. Some cultures are very emotional. Some cultures act out as a perfectly normal way of dealing with grief. And so it's important for us to ask folks, how can we best be of help? And don't let these variety of reactions frighten us as, as we see other people going through them. <clears throat> now, the thing you've probably all heard of the most are the Kubler-Ross Five Stages of Grief. There's almost no evidence to support this model, but the thing is it sticks around in popular culture. And the reason why it sticks around in popular culture is because there's some truth to all these things. Now, we may not go through them in a specific order. We may not go through all of them. We may get stuck in one or the other of them. But the reason why it's in our popular culture is because we really do experience them. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance in some order or another, or in some time or another. Another very popular uh, uh, theoretical examination of grief is the four tasks of mourning, and this is done by a guy named J.W. Warden. And according to Warden, the tasks of mourning are to accept the reality of the loss, to work through the pain of grief, to adjust to life without the deceased person, and to maintain a connection while moving on. And if you look at these, right, they make a lot of sense. They, uh, uh, they speak certainly to, to my experiences of, uh, of grief that I have had in the past, and, um, and probably to yours too. Another model is the dual process model of coping with, uh, uh, with bereavement. This one's a little bit more chaotic. It's not quite as clean. And it essentially shows people bouncing back and forth from this everyday lived experience of loss to restoration, to loss to restoration, right? Grief work, uh, in, intrusion, short of the waves I talked about earlier, the breaking the bonds, the denial, uh, uh, denial and avoidance of our feelings, right? Bouncing over to attending to the practical things or trying new things or trying to distract ourselves from grief, which can become unhealthy unhealthy in some circumstances, or denial and avoidance of grief. And this can lead to all kinds of things, right? It can lead to alcohol abuse, drug abuse, other, uh, other psychosocial problems. For some people, it's led to things like addiction, hoarding, um, um, uh, behaviors like that. So for some people, grief is a complicated process. It isn't quite so clean. And those are the people that really need help getting through it. And so... As a summary, no matter what theories you look at of grief or different stages, generally all models agree that there are some common symptoms, however they appear or in whatever order. And those include shock and disbelief, feeling numb, denial, sadness, loneliness, emptiness, guilt, shame, anger, helplessness, anxiety, insecurity, and lots of physical symptoms for some people like fatigue, 
and nausea and sickness or weight loss or gain, aches and pains, night sweats, heart palpitations, uh, feeling faint. Any, any one of which some of these should lead you to go to urgent care or call your doctor if they're significant enough. But certainly uh, uh, the most common ones I've felt in my personal life and, and seen in my practice are things like fatigue and nausea. Those are very, very common, especially in those initial moments of the shock of a grief experience. And so I'm talking about all these feelings that just fill our head and come and go, and it seems like they're just one big, messy uh, uh, experience of, of loss. And the truth is that they are. But I had the opportunity several years ago in 2009 to do some research around uh, how, how people recover from grief. And in this particular setting, it was how, how organ donor families recover from grief. And that research uh, uh, showed us that really there are three things that are central to people's recovery, family, friends, and faith, in that order. And so one of the things this should tell you as a potential grief counselor is that when you're working with people who are grieving, you want to make sure that we address um, uh, their family relationships and making sure that family is available to them, addressing their friends and making sure they're surrounded by friends that can be supportive. And if they are a person of faith, making sure that we bring that uh, 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 into this sort of uh, um, uh, assortment of ways that we help people deal with grief and bereavement. Now, sometimes grief isn't normal. As I said before, sometimes there's complications. We technically call that complicated grief. It's pretty rare, to be honest. But these are some of the kinds of instances when people might need some help. First of all, PTSD or trauma. And let me give you a really simple definition of PTSD or emotional trauma. It's when you relive an experience instead of simply being able to retell it. So if you think of an experience you had and thinking about it brings you back into that space in real time. You're reliving it. And that's common soon after a loss or soon after a trauma, but it should wear off. If it doesn't wear off, you're probably looking at a little bit of PTSD that could be helped by a grief counselor. There are some people who are at high bereavement risk, what we call a BRAT score, B-R-A-T. Um, and those include people who uh, who maybe are still working through a lot of anger or who have have poor relationships with their family and friends. Those folks may, uh, uh, might need a little extra help. Another group of people who might need more help is if the loss is what I call out of season, tragic or out of season. A child uh, uh, dies or someone is tragically and suddenly killed uh, in the middle of their life. Those are, are what we call out of season losses. Sometimes people need a little more help to get through those. Uh, another area where folks might need some extra help is if they've had a significant loss history. Um, and you can ask them about that just by uh, 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 bringing a simple question to the table and hearing a little bit about what their history has been. How many losses have they had? How significant have they been to them emotionally? Those are all important questions to ask to, to learn whether or not they might need some additional help. And finally, folks who who, who ask for help sometimes just do it because it feels better, because it, it helps them feel better to learn that a lot of the things they're going through are quote-unquote normal. And, and, and they're things that everybody essentially goes through when they experience a loss. In terms of grief, uh, of grief counseling or grief companioning, really the main goal of most of it is to help the client integrate the reality of their loss into their life going forward and help them maintain a healthy bond to the loved one they lost. And that's really straightforward. Uh, um, and that happens by helping them process the event story of the death. And, and processing means let them talk. Uh, uh, make sure you listen without interruption. Let their feelings be OK. Let uh, uh, how they tell you the story be OK. Be a good listener. That's what processing the event story of the death means. And also part of it is sometimes to assess the backstory of the relationship. Was there unfinished business there? Uh, is there guilt there? Did, 
did I not have the chance to tell my dad something before he died? In those cases, you want to help people find ways to close those loops. And sometimes they're simple little things. Someone says, you know, I, I, never, told, I never told my friend that I loved him before he died. Well, write him a letter or say it out loud or go to a special place that you shared together and make a ritual. Those are all simple ideas to try and help close those loops that seem so big and so gaping to people at the moment of a loss. And so the three things that a good grief counselor can do for the client really are to let them talk about the deceased, ask them about the person, allow them to speak, um, um, and make sure they feel like they're in a safe space. The second thing is, as I talked about earlier, help distinguish grief from trauma. If they are reliving the event, now we need to talk about perhaps some counseling or therapy for PTSD. And again, as I said a moment ago, help them deal with any guilt they're feeling and help them reorganize that grief. Help them find ways to do the things they need to do to say goodbye to those feelings of, of grief and sadness. One of the things I want to do is play a couple of short videos which give you some ideas about how other, um, how other cultures deal with um, uh, a grief, how other, uh, how, other, how other cultural and religious perspectives look like. So these are going to be four very short videos I'm going to play for you now. Two weeks ago, Riza Notiar heard his father's voice for the last time. He was COVID positive, so he'd been isolated. My, um, my mom had, um, had requested that we leave his cell phone by his ear. We couldn't have asked for a more kinder and gentle, more gentle way for, you know, God to take to take dad. In isolation, Notiar had to figure out how to bury his father while following Muslim rituals. In Islam, the deceased should be buried within 24 hours. Before that, the body must be washed, shrouded in this white cloth, followed by a communal prayer. All challenging during this pandemic. We had to uh, consult back and forth with medical experts, with uh, our scholars. Salwa Qadri is believed to be one of the few licensed Muslim funeral directors in Canada. Notiar's father was her mosque's first COVID death. With the advice of health experts, her specially trained team was able to wash, shroud, and bury him as safely as possible. Had Notiar's father died here in Ontario, it's unlikely these Islamic rituals would have been performed. That's because provincial guidelines now say that only licensed professionals can prepare COVID-19 victims for burial, but most mosques traditionally rely on volunteers to prepare the deceased. The Canadian Council of Imams has issued a directive saying, for safety reasons, the obligation to wash and shroud a body has now been lifted. It's news this imam says can be devastating for families. At the time of, of experience a loss of someone that you love, it is a very hard thing to, to swallow. Notier says he's struggling with grief during self-isolation. We, we can't hug each other, you know I mean? To hug my mom, to hug my kids, I mean, I'm yet to do that today. But he says he's grateful to Kadri for the lengths she went to to lay his father to rest. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Your Holiness, how is it possible to achieve inner peace and happiness when one suffer, when one suffers great pain due to personal loss, illness, addiction, depression, anxieties, or death among loved ones? Again, as I mentioned earlier, you see, look from wider perspective. One unfortunate things happen, but at the same time, there are some good things still there. So you lost your loved one. Very sad. But then think, uh, what use too much sad? Instead of sad, you should fulfill the wish of your, because of the loved one. For example, my own tutor, uh, I usually consider a very solid rock. I can lean away. When he passed away, I really felt 
No. That lost. But then I think now too much of sad or prayer will not bring him. Now I must sort of develop willpower to carry his, to fulfill his wish. That is brings sort of that uh, I said, that my very beloved, my, t- my teacher, that brings in sort of sadness, but it brings more inner strength and determination. So you should, do, you, you should do that way. Then that, although it's one side of your mind sad, but one side of your mind bring more sort of willpower, more determination to fulfill, you see, that, that person. Logically, if that person who passed away, some way to know you, in spite that tra- that sort of sad event, you still remain or say the, uh, the happy person or some kind of useful person, then the late your friend feel very happy. If you too much sad and completely demoralize, too much worry or crying, 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 I think the late person feel very sad. So think of this line. I do that. The death of a loved one is a very disorienting time and isn't something many people think about until it's actually happening to them. Judaism offers structured periods of mourning that help provide some support in the grieving process. Jewish tradition is to bury the dead as soon as possible. The period from the time of death until the funeral is called Aninut. After hearing about a death, immediate family members may tear a piece of their clothing This ripping is called Kriya. You're tearing a hole in the fabric of your normal life. Many do Kriya at the funeral. During Aninut, many people don't know what to say or do. Sometimes they ask mourners, is there anything I can do? They get the automatic response, no, I've got it under control. If you're a mourner, accept help. It's okay. You have a lot to plan and a lot on your mind. If you're a friend, offer to take care of errands, grocery store runs, or on the dog. It gives you a way to connect with the mourners and help in their grieving process. Meanwhile, traditionally, a Hevra Kedisha, or burial society, takes care of the body. You can find one through a funeral home or synagogue. As swiftly as possible, the funeral happens, sometimes the next day. Afterwards, friends and relatives bring a meal of consolation to the mourners. Unlike normal meals, where you are a gracious host, at this meal, the community takes care of you. Then Shiv begins. Traditionally, it lasts for seven days after the burial, and is an intense mourning period spent at home by the immediate family. The first 30 days after the burial comprise another period, called Shloshim family can go outside the house. During the Shloshim, some people won't go to concerts or parties, wear new clothes or shave. And for the children of the deceased, the entire mourning period, called Avelut, lasts for nearly a year, during which mourners recite a prayer called the Mourners Kaddish daily. At the end of Avelut, there's an unveiling service to place the tombstone at the grave. It's a time to remember again, to close this intense part of the cycle of mourning. But we never forget our loved ones. Four times a year, there is a special Yiskor service in synagogues to remember all those we've lost. And each year, on the anniversary of their passing, we say Kaddish again and light a Yotzite candle in their memory. To learn more, There are four more videos in this series.
they discuss caring for the body, the funeral. Calaveras, skulls, are whimsical and colorful. They are not frightening. They symbolize mortality and the cycle of life and death. The Aztecs always celebrated death. Life, they said, is just a dream. Only in death is when we truly awake. And today, we are not mourning their death. We are celebrating their life. Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, is a Mexican, joyous, and colorful holiday where we honor our loved ones who have passed. It's a tradition to place photographs and special items on an altar that remind us of our loved ones and offer their favorite foods. The spirits of the deceased will come back to Earth for one night to be with their family for this celebration. On this special holiday, we decorate an altar and place beautiful paper flowers like marigolds. Family members take part in decorating for the occasion. We light candles to guide their spirits back home. The decorations are festive, such as papel picado, which is a hand-cut tissue paper banner. We understand that death is a part of the circle of life, and today is a day to show that we are not afraid. Dia de los Muertos means to me that I can learn about my heritage and my family. I hope that your family will begin to celebrate this holiday that is special to me. Today I'm going to honor Great Grandma and Uncle Wolfgang. Today I'm honoring my Grandpa Wolfgang and my Grandpa Fred. Today I'm honoring my cousin Matthew. Today I'm honoring my great grandmother Anita. Today I'm honoring my grandpa Wolf. I talked earlier about this concept of the new normal. And one of the things that I really wanted to do with this, uh, uh, this brief uh, uh, series was give you a sense of, of, of all the different ways that cultures around the world uh, look at death and loss and, and all of the ways that they've looked at it across the centuries. And in, in almost every way, it brings us to this place where um, uh, we say to ourselves, normal is just a setting on a washing machine. Because after a loss, regardless of our culture, there really is no new normal. That person is gone, but in some way, they'll always be with us. And that, of course, is the whole idea of a healthy grief process and, and good grief counseling in those times when it's needed. And so once again, just a quick review. Grief is a natural emotional response that results from loss. Everybody deals with it differently. 
uh, uh, some people it, it can become difficult and painful and we call that complicated grief that requires some counseling perhaps but uh, a normal grief can vary uh, uh, between cultures and people and situations uh, um, it doesn't always require treatment about 10 percent of folks will need some some work on complicated grief after loss and it can be treated in a pretty straightforward way with counseling either psychotherapy or grief counseling or or other forms of counseling uh, uh, the stages in terms of, of of periods of grief can be acute like right after it happened and of course complicated grief when it continues and never seems to go away but then there's that that integrated grief right that thing that I've called several times the new normal after resolving these more intense symptoms of acute or complicated grief, you enter this lifelong stage where it's integrated. You've come to accept the reality of the loss. You've gone back to your daily life. It doesn't mean that you missed your loved one any less or that you don't feel pain at their memory. You've just learned how to live with it. You've learned how to cope. That acute, great, uh, acute grief may show itself again uh, I can tell you from personal experience that it often does, especially around holidays or anniversaries and other reminders, and that's okay. You shouldn't try to avoid those things. And once again, you know, if, if, if the grief cycle is allowed to, to open up and move forth, uh, uh, for most people it will move from shock and denial and anger and depression and detachment to a place of acceptance and a return to a meaningful life. I think it's important always to remember that grief changes us. It sculpts us into someone who understands more deeply, who hurts more often, who appreciates more quickly, who cries more easily, who hopes more desperately, and who loves more openly. If grief does its job right, my friends, it leaves your heart open. It leaves your soul open and it leaves you just as this picture says with the ability to love more openly. So let's go ahead and move back to my office. Well, that's our presentation on grief and bereavement today and the things that I really want you to take away from it is the sense of helping to make grief a more normal sort of thing that people can talk about and people can recognize happens to everyone at some point in their lives. And the second thing I want you to take away from it is the importance of looking at religious and cultural differences in how people experience grief. If you have any questions, you can always email me at donald.stouter at gmail.com. I'll be happy to answer. Until next time, thanks for being here today.